Hi, this is Joe McNally for Adorama TV, and today we're going to be talking about a specific kind of light that has a specific color. Adorama TV presents Photo on the Go with Joe McNally, where you'll go behind the scenes to see how great photos are made. Hi, this is Joe McNally for Adorama TV. The reason I go to Adorama, it's a real store with real people, and I've got friends and associates there who have guided me through all my camera purchases for years. As you know, the big three of light are quality, color, and direction. And in certain instances, you know, we are looking for broad light, you know, and light that just covers everything and is very soft. Other instances, especially the one we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about light that's very specific, a little harder in nature, that edges out a subject, defines its shape, and also, given the time of day that we're shooting at, has to have a specific color. It's a situation I'm going to show you here today where if I used just a white light flash with no gelling and no color to it, it would look inappropriate. It would look wrong. It would look out of place. So the image we're going to deconstruct today is actually on the wall behind me. Uh, lots of people have asked me about it and I did write about it in a book called Hot Shoe Diaries, but just in general. So today, let's specifically get into it and see what we did on location. Obviously, it's a cool looking plane, but it's delivered to me in utter darkness. We're talking like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning at China Lake Naval Air Station in California. So they bring out this cool object. And first and foremost, as a location photographer, you gotta sort this out quickly. And your lighting has to be kind of, you know, bang on right from the very start because you're not gonna get another crack at this. And the sunrise, as we all know, doesn't wait for anybody. So I got this cool plane. So let's look at it from up above, right? It kind of looks like a, a bat wing kind of deal. So we're looking straight down on it, for instance, okay? How do you light this thing? Well, you light around it. You define the shape of it because the shape is the graphic essence of the photograph. I was working with a lot of small flashes at the time, okay? So what I did was I hooked, thankfully they allowed me to do this, clamps with small flashes, three of them back here, here, and here. Also on this wing, matching up, position. What are they doing? They're banging straight down into the tarmac. Why would you say, are you lighting the ground? Well, I'm getting bounce off the ground, and what's happening is that bounce is wrapping around the object and defining it. Likewise, what I did up here in the front wheel well, which is right about here, nestled in the front wheel well are two more flashes right there. They too are banging straight down at the ground. So all this underneath lighting is the core of the picture, okay? And if it was left to go just bleached out white, well, you can see from the sunrise, which thankfully was a great sunrise, it would be out of place. I have to try to match the color and the temperature of the light, really, to what the environment is going to present me. So I put full cuts of CTO, all right? CTO stands for color temperature orange, convert to orange. It takes a white light flash and converts it to an incandescent temperature, i.e. something warm. So I've got pools now right underneath here, okay? And also up in here, kind of pools of very warmish light, just banging off the ground and, and then lifting up into the airplane. That works fine for the airplane, but the wings are a bit of a problem. This light is not gonna curl around and get onto these wings. So what I did here, okay, is I put two strip lights. Here's a thought, if you will. Try to take the shape of your light source and match it, at least occasionally, to the shape of your object. Luckily, I had two big strip lights with me. I like strip lights, like them a lot. They're long, narrow soft boxes. Okay, these guys in particular were two feet by six feet. They are on stand, obviously. They were powered at that point by two Profoto 7B packs. Each of them firing into the edges of the wings and the shape of the light matches the shape of the wings. These are very, very weak. All they're doing is defining the edge of the wing, and these are not gelled, okay? All I did with these was fire just a little bit of white light right in here to pick up the edges of the wings and define that, those sides of the aircraft. Camera placement, predictably, is right at the nose, slightly wide, about a 28 millimeter lens throw right in here. There's a pocket wizard radio that's firing one of these guys, and that's all I really need to do. Once one of these big sources fires, it picks everything up. 
These small speed lights, okay, are on SU4 mode or manual optical slave mode. So they will trigger with any sudden increase of light. So I've got orange pools of light underneath, two strips here, camera angle here, radio to this, this triggers everything else, and then what do I have to do? Wait for sunrise. And it came up, it came up really nicely. The happy accident of this picture is the reflective surface, the upper surface of the aircraft started to take on the color it was reflecting back off of the rising uh, morning light that's way in the background. Very lucky, very happy accident. Of course, I told my editors that I planned it that way. You always take credit for the happy, wonderful accidents on location. In this instance, I was shooting for the National Geographic. The story was called Future of Flight. It was the first all digital story ever published in the history of the National Geographic magazine. I sort of patted myself on the back after this shot because if you get a job that says Future of Flight and you get a picture like this, you think, you know, I did okay today. Geographic and its infinite wisdom chose not to publish it, okay? That's okay, you know, those are the vagaries of being a magazine photographer. Here's another thing that came out of that. I was using, for these lights clamped underneath, a really cheese ball third-party set of clamps, kind of cold shoe clamps that were always breaking. They were just terrible things to work with. I was going through them by the bushel basket. I called my friend Justin, who was then at Bogan, okay, which is now Manfrotto, and I said, there's got to be something. And he brought over a bunch of bits and pieces, and he cobbled together in my studio with me this, which has come to be known as the Justin Clamp, otherwise known in the Manfrotto catalog as the 175F. Now, this one we've modified. There was a period of time where the Nikon SB900 and 910 now uh, have come out. They have a beefier hot shoe, which was difficult to fit into the original cold shoes that came with this clamp. Now, this clamp has been updated, and the cold shoes that come right out of the box fit virtually any speed light out there. But in that interim, we updated this, and we put on these little Frio plastic clips, which work really, really well. And so this is kind of the, the de facto, state-of-the-art way that we clamp small speed lights in all manner of places. So once again, Joe McNally for Adorama TV. We talked about specific light and a specific color for that light and how you define an object. Many thanks to the folks at Adorama for creating the Adorama TV channel. You know, it's a great educational sort of outlet and frankly, I'm able to do these videos for them and answer a bunch of questions people have had about pictures like this one, people have asked me about for a long time. So there it is, deconstructed courtesy of Adorama TV. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. Place your order by 8 p.m. and it ships the same day. Plus, next time you're in New York City, be sure to visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.